Oh, hello, Lyle. I caught you mid-drink. <laughs> <Yeah>. Hello. <laughs> no, you're actually drinking coffee because you're drinking coffee all the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. told Storm, it's like my pacifier. It makes me more comfortable when I'm uncomfortable if I have coffee. That's funny. I'm better. Well, today we're finishing up Live Love, the 2020 version. And you've been here for all of them because you're like OG vintage. Um, Jasmine's kind of already sat down and kind of told a little bit about her story, but she's kind of got drug into this, I guess, by you. Because how did you even hear that I was planting a church? Did I tell you at something in South Carolina? Yeah, I was at a summer camp, I think at Table Rock, South Carolina, and hadn't seen you in months. Knew you were in Greensboro area, kind of in the back of my mind, but Anyway, I just saw you and thought, hey, I'm going to go talk to Matt. Asked what you were doing, and you said, planting this church in Greensboro. Yeah. So that's how I knew. And I remember we had, we'd already moved to Greensboro, and we were kind of just getting started. And somehow you, you got my number, and you called me and said, hey, dude, I want to hear more about this church plant. What made you even take that step? Uh, halfway through my senior year of college, I realized oh no, I'm about to graduate and I don't have a plan. So uh, just spent a few days just with that rolling around in my head and nothing came from that thought other than I want to reach out to Matt and see what's going on and can I somehow be a part of it. So I had your number from, I guess, before. Yeah. That was it. Because, yeah, when, when we were in South Carolina, we, we started a contemporary service at the church that we were pastoring at. And you were friends with a guy who was very involved at that church at the time and used to come play guitar. And so I guess that's where we met. Um, and yeah, I remember you called me and I think you said, hey, like, do you need somebody to lead worship? And I was like, dude, we need somebody to do everything. But we have no money, like we can't pay you. And that's what I think has, was crazy. Well, let's go back. You ended up driving up to Greensboro and like we just kind of hung out for the day. Yeah, basically it was after that conversation on the phone, you kind of said, why don't you come up and let's talk more in depth. And see, so yeah, I drove up and we hung out and you kind of told me the whole vintage thing. And at that point, I was really excited and like I was in. I don't know if at that point you had already said there's no money. I don't know, but I was in. Um, but also was recently engaged or about to be engaged. The timeline's fuzzy. We argue, Jasmine and I, about that. Um, so there's kind of that thing. Like, I was in, but it was kind of like, I need to get Jasmine in or we aren't going to do this. Yeah. So, as in me and her aren't going to do this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, you, and then you moved up here. So all that worked out. And I was like, yeah, dude, we, we need, and you came on as our worship pastor and you, you moved up here and you moved in with Jason and Jenny Austin. Yep. Yeah, I had one big bag, and I lived in a spare room, I guess they had, and uh, lived with them for three or four months, which is really good, but um, I'm super thankful for them in that time. Yeah. I had to hide my recycling in the closet. I'm a big, uh, I'm an avid recycler, and they didn't recycle, so I kept a, a bin in my closet and recycled, but it was good. So you came on and got a job? Yeah, while I was there at Jason and Jenny's, um, I needed to earn an income. Jasmine and I weren't married yet, but I knew we, we couldn't live in Jason and Jenny, so uh, needed an income. And luckily, I had kind of like what you had done before coming up. I had raised some support from like my home church, and it was almost enough monthly to cover what our rent would be in an apartment, but we also needed to eat. So um, I got a, a job at an insurance agency selling insurance, which... I liked because I like to learn stuff, but I don't like selling. So it wasn't a good fit, but it paid so that I could be a part of Vintage. Yeah. And at that time, like, dude, we really, you, you and I both were getting paid by people outside the church. And we had a few people that started to give and that kind of thing. And then finally, what year did we bring you on full time? It's 2010. I think the fall is when I got to quit the, the other job. And yeah. I was excited. And it was just me and you, the only paid. Yep. In this little office, yeah. We sat closer than this, but back to back. <laughs> so by then, the church had moved to Randleman, and we rented a little tiny 
storefront in on Main Street. Yeah, and the floors were sloped. So if you pushed your chair the right way, you could like roll across the entire office. <laughs> it was one room and a bathroom. In a shower. There was a shower in that bathroom. And our desks were kind of like back to back. And then that, like that was it, man. Yep. And we were worshiping in, at Randleman High School still at the time. Mm-hmm. And you led worship for several years for us. Like that was, that was your... That was your passion, especially at that yeah. point. Not that it still isn't in a lot of ways, but you came on and were our worship pastor for several years. Yep. And then Christian Hahn. Yeah, he came on in 2015. Yeah. As Connections. Yeah. Talk about how, how that changed. Because now you sit here and you're our executive pastor and we're going to get into what that involves and what that means and all the things that you do Um, in a minute, but what was that like when you kind of, when when we made that transition from, all right, you, you are OG vintage, you've built the worship ministry of our church. And now here is somebody and you're about handing the baton of the leadership of that ministry to him was your idea. How did, and it says a lot about your personality how, what was God doing in you in that moment that gave you the self-awareness and humility just to even kind of make that transition? Yeah. So going back to college, I went to Southern West University. I felt called into ministry when I was almost in 11th grade. Um, I didn't know what for though, you know, what kind of ministry or whatever. So went to Southern West University and just kind of assumed youth ministry, uh, because I didn't feel any different. God wasn't like loudly yelling at me what to do. But I'd always also had a passion for music and worship music. And my whole life, you know, played in the band at church and stuff and taken music lessons and all that. So music was a big part of my life. And uh, so I went to college and kept being a part of worship bands and stuff. And then started to feel, maybe I don't want youth ministry. Maybe I want it to be like a college age ministry. Those are the people. Um, and then I started thinking, maybe I just want to work with peers. I don't know. I couldn't nail down in school and they're kind of forcing you to pick like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I couldn't pick, but I was minoring in music and just kind of exploring all the ministry options, I guess. And then went on an internship under a worship pastor in Indiana. And that's where it kind of felt like a little bit of a click of like, I have some passion and skills in this music area and it's also ministry. So I'll do ministry in that. But even then, I didn't feel like God was saying like, worship ministry is your life. So I started to wrestle with that and felt like God was just telling, like that I'm called to serve the church and it doesn't really matter how. And so I felt, I've felt comfortable with that since the beginning of Vintage, just being called to serve the church. So luckily I got to lead worship for a while and I really loved it. I love like all the aspects, the nuts and bolts and music and all that. Um, but then Christian came along and he was kind of, he was starting to co-lead and crushing it. And it just felt like he could take it and do things I can't do on the platform and run with it and do it better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then there were some other things happening at Vintage that I just felt like needed attention. And again, I never felt called to lead worship. So I didn't have this, like I wasn't tied to it, you know, it was just, I feel called to serve the church and I think I can do it in another role and that Christian could come lead worship better than me, pick up and take it to a new area or a new level. And I mean, there was a little bit of like, I felt like it was my baby, but I mean, I trusted he wasn't going to ruin it. Um, I was excited to make the transition, but I was sad. Like, you know, I wouldn't get to play guitar as much and stuff like that. But in this role I'm in now, it feels just as much as a, a good fit as that one did. So yeah, that's been it. Dude, I don't think I have, I could say enough how inspired I am by the way that you handled that. Because you did, you, you laid all the foundation. You did all the dirty work and the legwork that Christian is obviously, you laid a foundation that Christian has build, been able to build on. But without the foundation that you laid, it would, it would not be where it is. And I think Christian would say that as well. But just the fact that you had the humility to say, 
hey, there's somebody that God's brought to our church that I think can do this maybe better than me, different than me, and I'm gonna let them do it. But here's some other things that God has put in my heart that I think our church needs attention and needs attention in. And you're, you're, I've always told people, you're a weird combination of stuff because very few creative music people also have the administrative organizational skills that you possess. Like you're this weird mixture of stuff. Yeah, and I feel that. I constantly feel like I'm... It's awesome though, because you know, when you think about music and creatives and people like that, a lot of times you don't think organization and structure and systems and processes, and yet somehow you kind of have both. But at the same time, I think your musical approach was very systematic in some ways. But, but eventually you became our executive pastor and there's a ton of things that you do in that role. And one of the things that you've shifted to over the last several years kind of leans into what I really want us to focus our conversation in on today. And that's in the area of finance. And The reality is the ministry of God's church is dependent on the money of God's people. And I'm not a money person and very few pastors are, but I want people to hear the heart behind the way we approach finances and funding ministry and that kind of stuff because I think people need to hear that stuff. People trust us with their hard-earned money and giving them kind of an opportunity to look behind the curtain and hear how we approach finances and funding ministries and that kind of stuff. So just start talking about all that stuff. Well, one, I think it's good that you're not in it. And not when you say you're not a money person, I mean like you can add. So you're not disqualified for anything. But I think for you and lead pastors in general, it's good for you to not have to think about it, have to worry about it, have maybe the target on your back or the temptation or people... I don't know, thinking I can write this check and then the pastor's going to have lunch with me or weird stuff like that. Um, I don't think it's appropriate probably for the lead pastor to be super involved in it. Not because you might do something sketchy, but I don't know. It it could potentially paint a different picture in your mind of people and stuff like that. So I'm glad that you're not in it. Yeah, and And it it gives you the time to do what you should do. And there's a burden that I don't carry knowing that somebody like you is paying attention to that stuff because it takes money to run the church. Yes. (laughs) And I think one of the things that can hinder pastors from vision and leadership is to be consumed with the bottom line and that kind of stuff. And I don't have to worry about that because there's somebody as strategic as you. Yeah, and sometimes it's heavy and sometimes it's not, but it's... um still overwhelming a lot of times in a good way of thinking how do we grow and it's all discipleship how do we better disciple and enable our people to do what god wants them to do financially um so wrestling with that how do we do it better and keep people's trust and keep things transparent and stay on top of stuff because it's you know um every month we got to close out the books and we got to review stuff and to make sure people are on budget and on track and that we're bringing enough to meet payroll but then also working towards future goals and paying off debt and all that mess. So um, it is a lot. And I could see how it would be, it would uh, be difficult to sometimes carry it and also preach and teach and lead and be able to pastor people from a good place. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think has been cool since you've stepped into this role and into this area of our church is you've, you've kind of been the architect with how we fund ministry. Talk about just like the philosophy behind that and just kind of the things that you've tried to strategically implement so that our church can function properly. And as detailed as you want to be, I know it may get kind of, it can get kind of like in the weeds really quickly, but I, I want people to understand kind of our philosophy behind how we invest the resources that we're given. Yeah. So, hmm. Each department budgets for a calendar year. So like worship has a budget, production, kids, students, facilities, operating, everybody has their own. And we're 
big in telling the department pastors and leaders to to use the budget as a tool. Like it is the roadmap to fund your ministry. So God gives you, you know, in alignment with our church, like the current vision, but God gives you a vision on how to accomplish that within your ministry. And then you use a budget like a planning tool. You sit down with a calendar and sit down with how we do budgets and start figuring out, you know, how do I fund what God's calling me to do? When am I going to do it? All that. So each department puts that together. Um, we kind of sit down and filter through it. Then it goes to our elder team, ultimately for them to put the final stamp of approval on really the overall dollar amount. We trust all of our pastors and leaders well enough that if they feel like they need something and they put it in their budget, then they, they need it. Um, like we don't really nitpick what they're going to do. So basically, I mean, it's very much a staff led budget process, elder approved. So each department goes at it that way versus uh, there could be a temptation to just say, let's just give, maybe the church leadership decides, let's just give this department 6000 because last year they spent 5000 And let's just give this department 2000 because they never spend money or whatever. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of backwards because you could be tying up those resources on some department that could, that money could go to some something else that's actually accomplishing the mission and vision of the church. So, and we feel like our pastors know the their area of ministry better than anybody. So, <clears throat> yeah. So that's it. Let let the staff create the budget basically, and then we track every month what you know comes in and what goes out. And if there's a month where we're low, if we don't bring in enough, then Two months later, we cut that, so we kind of always, because we can't control income in a church. You know, we can't sell more stuff. We're dependent on people being obedient and hoping that the money comes in that we told production they're going to get to spend in March or May or whenever. So um, it's kind of a balancing act to even out spending when income could be or giving could be all over the place. But luckily, we have a good team of staff that doesn't, they get it, you know, they they budget uh, like in a very vision way, and then they stay on top of it. Um, we have a good elder team that is very smart and capable and helps make sure we don't set a number too high, but they also, once they've given that stamp of approval, I mean, we're ready to roll. So, Yeah, and I think one of the things that, and again, this has been driven by you over the last several years, is I feel like every dollar is driven by vision because of the way that you forced everybody to kind of budget. Because not only we don't allow people just to say, well, I want $50,000 next year. They have to really detail in detail let yeah, us they know. break out what is it and when is it and yeah. here's the link. and Unpack that a little bit. Even not only do they have to kind of show like this is what we're going to buy, where we're going to spend money, but even when we're going to spend money, like even like a monthly kind of spending plan. Yes, yeah, so they have to do it monthly for several reasons. One, I think it helps them put, once they've done this work of creating their budget down to a monthly, you know, detail, the next year all they have to do is pull their budget out as kind of their roadmap to ministry. Like, oh yeah, I was going to do this event or oh yeah, I was going to buy this thing. So it helps them in that way, but then it also helps us from a spending perspective where you don't have every department wanting to spend a lot of money in one month. So we, if we can, we can kind of try to even spending out and then hold people to it. You know, hey, you said you were going to do this event in June. All right, why aren't you doing it? You know, mm -hmm. um, is it you forgot or maybe God changed? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so it helps a lot in that. And then also too, like we we want everybody to break even. You know, if you budgeted $25,000, then, and you felt like that's what God was calling you to do, then, or saying you needed, then really you should come out have spending, spending that much, so. Yeah. And I think this may seem like a weird conversation for maybe some people, but I think this is stuff that our church needs to hear. Again, but it comes back to, we are entrusted with people's, hard-earned resources. And I think people knowing how we approach investing those resources is really, really important. And, you know, talk about that just a little bit more. Like how, 
because you look at it every day, you see it more than anybody sees it, like helping people understand how much we value. Yeah, I would say there's several ways that we could like show that or it's evident. Um, well, one, I think when you come into our building, you can see hopefully, wow, these people, whether it's take care of this place or it smells nice or it's clean or it's pretty um, or like, oh, they have all this fancy stuff. I mean, I don't think it looks like we don't spend money <laughs> um, <laughs> that this is a, a cheap operation. Mm. Second, um, like a security thing, like we're, we're, you know, we use third party, like our bookkeepers, we outsource our bookkeepers. So that protects us, our leaders, and um, gets more trust from our church people because we're not the ones doing that. It's a third party. So nothing can really go wrong. Um, I had another thought. You made me, oh, and then, so then you would get like, if you looked at our overall budget, how our percentages break down. Typically, they would say in the church world, if your payroll, your payroll should be around 50%. Some people say as high as 55, but our payroll is like 41%. So we're very lean in that regard, but that allows, that frees up money to go to ministry. Um, our production budget this past year is like 18% of our overall church budget. That stuff's just expensive. And we value it as a tool. I mean, you kind of have to. So I think that's another way, too, we can show people, like, hey, we are stewarding your resource as well. We've paid off debt. We're debt-free. Um, we had, you know, $350,000 of money that we borrowed to get into the space and to upfit it. And this year, that's gone. We have more savings on hand than we ever have. And then you can look at how, again, just the breakdown of where we're putting it versus churches where... Well, here's six thousand yeah. dollars, and and all their ministry budgets add up to, I don't know, a single digit percentage. Ours are much, much, much higher. Yeah, and we keep our operations really, really lean. Outsourcing, bookkeeping helps. Um, I mean, down to our phone system, it works really well, but it's also super cheap. So, trying to keep, make sure we can keep money where it matters, like ministries, and making people think every dollar through the lens of vision. Yeah, I think that's one of the thing, and not just kind of toot our own horn a little bit, but when you look at where we invest, and that's another thing that we need to remind people is we make profit and loss statements available at any time. If yep. anybody ever wanted to see where money's going. Yeah, our elders have like their own, uh, well, it's a website, but where they, I mean, they see it, we do reports and stuff, but just so church people know, yeah, our elders can dig through where every penny goes down to the month, you know, so yeah. they, they know. And again, yeah, to our people, if somebody asks if they want to know, it's kind of boring. Your eyes might glaze over, but we've got it. But when you look at it, I think you see a balanced budget. And by balanced, I don't mean like amount in versus amount out. I mean about balance in where we invest. That I think where churches have made mistakes is your you're heavily investing in other areas and, and, and under investing in some. And I think when, yeah. Well, I was going to say, we, I agree. And you can see that because whenever we get to the end of the year and we start budgeting for the next year, it feels like we've got so many irons in the fire. And that balance you're talking about, it's like we have aggressive savings goals. We have aggressive debt payment goals. We have... We want to compensate our staff properly, which you could argue maybe we're not, but we also want to fund our ministries really, really, really well. Um, so it's just like you've got, we want to hire new staff. We've got a bunch of new gear we need to buy. You can see that balance in the tension of trying to keep all those irons in yeah. the fire. Yeah. And you know, the, the reason why this is a good time to have this conversation is because we just spent several weeks unpacking vision. And I go back to maybe something I said earlier that vision without resources is just a dream. That every single part of our vision requires resources. It requires money. It requires investment. And, you know, I think that transparency builds trust. And we've been as transparent as we can possibly be when it comes to money. And not just that people can see it, but how strategically we're approaching it. 
Yeah. What else do you want to say about just overall finances and vision? And yeah, I mean, there's, I don't, maybe, there's just a lot I'm proud of. I'm proud of, obviously, this is my only employment, ministry employment has been at Vintage. But through it, you know, we bump into other church leaders and other churches and just in the church world, you read articles and watch webinars and all that. And I'm really proud of how we handle giving, um, you know, you know, how secure it is, how we do budgeting, and even statistics on the number of people that give. Most churches, and who knows how 2020 will change this, but because uh, every stat has basically been thrown out the window. But there's something like 20% of the church congregation are the people that fund most churches, you know, and we have more than that. So there's just a lot about vintage that I think is brag worthy. Yeah. And even like down to the nuts and bolts of when people give here, none of that's through our website or on our servers, you know, like we're compliant and all that mess. And yeah. um, our giving platform uses like bank level security and um, we have to do compliance on all of our computers and stuff just for that. So yeah, there's a lot I'm proud of it. And I'm, I like, I feel like too, you talking about the balance and how do we navigate encouraging people to give when it's a biblical concept, God asks commands, whatever of you to do it, but we don't just hammer that on people. Like here it's we talk about vi- giving very little. Yeah, we really never do. I mean, people ride you, especially in other team meetings. You don't talk about giving enough. You don't talk about giving enough. But there's a joke that when you do talk about it, giving goes down. Um, but yeah, I feel like, we, and it's good because we're a church. Our goal is, to, our number one priority is discipleship and inspire people to live and, lo- live and love like Jesus. The byproduct of that, one of them, should be and is giving. Yeah. And so our goal is disciple, disciple, disciple. And a byproduct of that will be people will fund the vision. Yeah. And in Philippians, Paul talks about that. Like he, you know, he has that letter where he's thanking the church for giving. You guys were the first ones, the early adopters, whatever, of funding this. Yeah. And he talked about, um, actually I've got it on my phone because I don't remember it, but he's writing them this letter and this is verse 17. It says, really, it is not that I want to receive gifts from you, but I want you to have the good that comes from giving. And he basically said, I mean, we say it all the time, like you're not giving two vintage, you're giving three vintage. It's not what we want from you, but what we want for you. And you see him saying that like, yeah, minister, like you said, it costs. It costs a lot of money and there is overhead and I mean, it just costs money. But that's not why we ask yeah. for it or encourage you to do it. It's because you're on this journey of living and loving like Jesus and a part of that journey at some point should be and would be giving. Yeah. You know, we've never wanted anybody to do anything out of obligation. We don't want people to serve out of obligation. We don't want you to show up on Sunday out of obligation. We don't want to give out of, out of obligation that when we're doing all these things out of obedience, we're serving out of obedience to God. We're coming to worship because in obedience, we want to be with God's people. And when it comes to giving, it's an act of obedience. And you can't pressure people into obedience. It's, it, it is definitely a heart thing. Uh, and, you know, even as we're sitting here talking, 2020 has obviously been a challenging year, but in, there's so much that, that Lyle won't say because he, he doesn't want the attention or the credit for it. But even the, the things that, that you were the driving force and implementing before 2020 ever came, you know, we talk about how when COVID hit, if you had a pre-existing ca- condition, it kills you. And it's the same way for churches, organizations, and businesses. The pre-existing culture before COVID hit is shaping how we're all navigating this. And you were one of the first ones to push us towards digital giving, the right digital giving platform, people to get into recurring giving and all that kind of thing. And then even, and I don't know if people even really caught this, the way that we strategically budget, that people have a monthly budget within their yearly budget. And so when COVID hit, we were, we were on pace because we're not just spending these, it's not like we've handed $25,000 to a single department and they got to spend it in January. Right, yeah, we know from month to month to month what's gonna go out. And some of that we can control. 
So in Obviously COVID, rent, hit, but yeah, we were able to adjust in a way. Yeah, we were able to ratchet spending down to the bare necessities and ask departments and look at on paper because we'd already done they'd done the hard legwork of what do you absolutely have to have and can get by with during this time and and not and so we, there was already a lot of legwork done luckily through our budgeting process that made some of those conversations easier but yeah we were able to to hit pause on some stuff and then already have an accurate picture of of what has to go out what has to come in um God has been extremely faithful, though, and people have been extremely faithful and extremely obedient in that we haven't seen a hit, um, which has been incredible because we've been doing ministry. I mean, uh, where we didn't spend in 2020, that was the thing, too. Luckily, we had, people had done the legwork of making these budgets for 2020, but then 2020 happened, and yeah. some of it we could have just thrown out the window because there's a lot of stuff we didn't budget for that we had to buy to get kids ministry back somewhat in and up and running. Unfortunately, they met their budget. They spent all they had to spend in like September. So um, this year has been more expensive in areas that we didn't even know were coming. Yeah, just to keep functioning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just think of, you know, you don't wait for things like this to start building systems that prepare you for it and the systems that your leadership has implemented has helped us navigate this season so well. It all helped us cheat a lot of time, I feel like. Like because we had a healthy giving community, like they're used to giving digitally, so now we don't have to waste time trying to communicate. How do we onboard you now from paper, cash, checks, mail yeah. to this? We didn't have to spend months doing that because we'd already done that. And like you said, the budgets were in place and set up in a good way where we didn't have to spend a lot of time now renavigating that. We had already been doing pretty regular elder team meetings and set up the system of reports going where they go. So we didn't have to really create that system. Uh, it really, it just changed to let's, because there's so much uncertainty for a few months, let's just kind of watch and let's do our elder team meetings over video. Yeah. But other than that, we didn't really have to change a lot. Yeah. And you're right, because so much of it was in place early on, and we didn't have those, those pre-existing conditions that could have crushed us yeah. like they have other churches. Yeah. A couple final thoughts. Uh, anything you just want to say to those folks who financially have made our church possible for the last 12 years? <laughs> I've tried to think about what could, other than like, Thank you. Yeah, it sounds not, like not enough. I don't know what the word is uh, to just say thank you. Yeah. I hope my prayer would be like that passage in Philippians that God has done more for those givers and they've gotten more out of their giving than we have or mm -hmm. even the recipients of this ministry of Vintage have. You know, I hope, because I've sat across the table with people who have in tears talk about what their giving has done for them mm. and how God has blessed them and been faithful. And I have, you know, the stories of my life and pretty much everybody, I feel like if you get into a deep conversation of somebody who faithfully and obediently gives, they'll start rattling that stuff off of we started giving or we upped our giving or whatever. There's something about giving. There was a switch where we became faithful in it and then God provided and God did this and God did this. And to the point where now, anytime God asks them to do something, they just do it. They have such a trust knowing God will be faithful. And so I would say that one, thank you. And we don't do a good enough job as, as vintage at celebrating the stories and showing them how their giving has impacted the kingdom. We need to do better at that. Yeah. But I would just say, I hope and I pray and I believe that the givers who have made this possible have gotten more out of it and God has blessed them. So. Yeah. Well, here you are 12 years later, or 13 almost now, I guess, since we started having these conversations. And you're still here. I'm still here. <laughs> Not going anywhere. So finished with that. Our, you, you called me back in, I guess it was the fall of 2007-ish, as we were yeah, -ish. landing. You were single. Not, ma not yet married, man. Now you're married, three kids later, different role and that kind of stuff. What's your feeling about the future? Uh, I'm very hopeful for the future. 
kind of going about that same thing, seeing what God's done the last 12 years and how he set the last 12 years up with the previous however many years, you know, um, just how, how God has knit all this together and seeing God's, when we looked back and had to make decisions like moving from Greensboro to Randleman and then from one school to another school and from an office to an office to an office, a lot of it was just, there was uncertainty and my even coming on to vintage in the first place, I never felt like God was telling me to do it. But... God gave us enough yeah. to step out in faith. See, I'm extremely hopeful for what the future has, for what God has for Vintage, for our staff, um, my family. I'm excited. Yeah. I think 2020 on all the junk that came with it, there'll be, we'll learn from it, and it's going to be over soon. The church is going to be busting at the seams, not just Vintage, but all of them. Yeah. Um, the families are going to be doing well, so I'm yeah. excited. Well, I've told people for years that Lyle believed in me or believed in vintage before anybody ever should have. And dude, I can't imagine what this journey would have been like without you. And I hope I never have to. Me too. It was an easy buy though. You just talked about, I remember going back to Jasmine and my parents and you had laid out this, I mean, I'm sure you said it like, like really, really well, but basically it was like acts like you've talked about. And I remember thinking like, holy cow, that sounds awesome to be a part of a church where mm. people come to know Jesus daily. Like I didn't see that. I grew up in the church and I didn't see that. And where people are getting baptized and where the community was growing and like just that was really attractive to be a part of a church that was like a biblical church. Yeah. So, but also I knew it was going to be a good opportunity to learn and to grow. And I mean, God was just kind of not... Not telling me to do it, but also not telling me not to do it. So. Yeah. Well, here we go. Let's see what the next 12 yeah. years has. <laughs>